God has no name is back. This is Shane, your host, and with me as always, Tom. Tom, how are we feeling today, man? Feeling good. Just got back from a run, you know, uh, breathing in that fresh Corona air. And uh, now uh, now back to shelter in place here, locked into the apartment. Uh, and, and what better way to escape the the constraints of the physical world by by diving into the the wonderful fantasy of Brandon Sanderson. Yeah, and you know, getting a uh, getting some outdoors, some fresh air doesn't hurt. I know if you are uh, quarantined, like where we are in in Philly, the weather's starting to get a little bit nicer. So maybe some reading outside in the yard if you can, you know, or on your like deck if you have like a porch or something. I think that's what what I might get into tomorrow as we look uh, as we move forward into part four now. But we finished part three this week, and there were certainly some interesting chapters. I mean, the the one interlude in particular was really uh was really action packed so definitely an, uh, an entertaining reading for us this week let's start off though with chapter 49 we can get right into it this is this is Kaladin chapter here i think this was his last chapter in the present time for this week we had one Kaladin, one shallan one flashback and then the interludes so you know this one he it kind of starts off with them in the chasms you know on chasm duty you know walking through and you know they're really about to start training like mm-hmm. this like spear training that Kaladin is kind of setting themselves up for now mm-hmm. Kaladin is like he he has like an inner monologue in this chapter in the beginning where he's talking about um you know maybe he's cursed or you know talking about old magic we heard that a couple times here so you know that kind of seems like a Chekhov's gun to me the old magic thing but there was one little tidbit that he said that I thought was interesting. And he said, uh, stories of evil men made immortal then tortured over and over again. And how he said there's like, you know, these are probably just stories, but, you know, every story has a start or some truth into it. And that sounds like the the heralds to me, you know, whether or not they were evil men made immortal. I don't know about that part, but the tortured over and over again in damnation kind of, you know, rings some uh so, some memories from the prelude there how they were talking about ever after each desolation they would go through damnation or, or you know maybe i'm mixing up the two words damnation and desolation but more or less that's what the heralds would go through right yeah yeah they they were hitting on in the in the prelude that that was basically their process they would live a full life they would you know fight for men on earth and then when they were ready to when they you know had not defeated the desolate i think it was that when they had had not defeated desolation and they were ready to reset things. They basically had to live through a full cycle of, of damnation. Um, yeah. So interesting little tidbit there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. And certainly a story from the past, but I think we're led to believe, and, and, and I'm sure we'll get a, like similar to his dark materials where a lot of these kind of like fantastical elements and angels and demons and things like that kind of uh, blended in and, and, and melded in as we got into the later books in the series, I think we'll probably see a lot of these, these stories and, and the, you know, these tall tales and a lot of these things um, translated into reality and, and brought to the, the present moment. Yeah. Now we still don't know the, the heralds that were left. We still don't know at the end of the prelude there, did they go back to, you know, like wherever the heralds came from originally, like where the Voidbringers chased them out of before, you know, people were supposedly on Rashar, or are they living among like the people? Do you think, um, you know, somewhere on Rashar, maybe isolated or because, you know, the whole point was it seemed like they didn't want to go through desolation again to get, you know what I mean, to fight another one. So, you know, just some food for thought there that I would that that quote made me think of. It brought me back to the heralds and kind of revisiting that because I'm sure in part four and five maybe we'll find a little bit more out, you know, about the heralds and maybe the radiance too, the the the, um, the successors of them afterward. Yeah, definitely, definitely a good connection. Yeah, so you know, as the chapter moves on here, Kaladin, you know, is teaching the men, being like the drill sergeant. And, you know, he doesn't, I, I you know, he mentions typically in, in training, you know, you got to beat the men down to bring them back up. But, you know, these men have already, you know, been broken time and time again at this point. So, you know, he teaches them that it's okay to care, which I think is an interesting, uh, you know, certainly shows Kaladin's like unique viewpoint on, on fighting. Um, and I guess that was from one of his drill sergeants from when he was under Amarin's army. And he's, you know, moving that forward, giving, pushing that forward to his men now. Um, 
there was there was a moment here where rock kind of told us a little bit about his like his people and how the, you know they operate they're much less of a warrior society mm-hmm. you know the first and second son to make food and that's what he is the third son is a craftsman and then only the fourth son is a warrior so rock you know it seems like he despite being you know the strong silent type here isn't going to be doing any fighting for now but i, I would be shocked if kaladin doesn't end up teaching him you know later you know maybe in the next book right maybe maybe rock will uh will dish out some some horn eater some horn eater action for us honestly i kind of agreed with the logic here uh i, I don't know what you thought about it in particular but like basically the, the first two sons farming and food is the most important because you can't you can't build anything or you can't support your community if you're not if you're you know if you're hungry or if you're dead so that made sense first son goes to the most important duty then the second one, the craftsmen, like, yeah, they're building, they're supporting the local community. And then the the third was like, okay, now that everyone's well and fed, like, you're being born to, to fight our wars. Like, we're going to take care of our own first. No one can do anything when they're when they're hungry and not fed. And so they're, you know, building from within. And I and honestly, I think I think we could learn a lot from the the horn eaters and their and their perspective. Yeah. Yeah, I also appreciate Sanderson making such unique, different <clears throat> cultures um, compared like compared to the Alethi, right? So much, you know, way less emphasis on competition and battle. But I was also thinking, too, you know, I, I, I'm not sure where, where exactly on the Rashar map that Rock and his people hail from. But I know that they mentioned mountains, like he came down from the mountains to try to find the Shard Blade for his, um, you know, his lord. But... Mm-hmm. You know, maybe because they're up in the mountains, they were like well defended and didn't have, you know, those uh, those battles growing up or as they're like, you know, throughout history that they were able to, you know, not put such an emphasis on warriors and focus on, you know, food and craftsmanship. Um, so, you know, I, I appreciate the, the the world building there. Right. Yeah. Now. It kind of reminded me of. Like... Um, uh, sorry to, to interject. Uh, yeah, no problem. Oh, now I'm totally blanking on the name when I interject it. The, oh, <laughs> What's like it the called? knights, the knights, knights of the Vale. Like you know how they were kind of isolated on the top of a mountain, and, and they were kind yeah. of there to take care of their own. I, I, that's what yeah. I. That's what I imagine the Horn Eater Society being like, just kind of isolated and, and, and carved into the side of the hills. Yeah. So I would. Yeah. Exactly. Something similar like that, where they, you know, were well defended, didn't face a lot of attacks. That that's kind of the vibe that I'm getting, just based off of that policy alone, um, and like the mountain aspect. Now, the next part of this chapter, Syl reveres herself to Lopin, David, and Shen, uh, which is, you know, Lopin is a, you know, always has a couple gancho, couple gancho one liners for for Cowden and the men. So she's basically going to do the same thing that she did with the um with the weeds when they were searching for that like ointment to help heal the wounds. Um, she's just going to find and the scavenge lead them to it, so that way they, while Kaladin trains the other men. They can hopefully make up for the lack of manpower by still just like finding everything and then accumulating it. So that way they have, you know, stuff to bring back because obviously if they don't find anything, then um, the, uh, the, the new bright Lord is going to, you know, come down on them, take away chasm duty, which would ruin everything at that point. So that's the plan with them as of now in with, with Kaladin's training though, the, the key takeaway I had, was Moash, Drehi, and Scar were doing the best. And I was wondering, you know, if there's about 30 to 40 men in the bridge crew, you know, maybe they would be like the new sub-squad leaders, like similar to how Dalit was kind of like second in command um, in the in the beginning in Chapter 1. You know, maybe Moash, Drehi, and Scar are going to become like the sub-squad leaders. And it would be cool to see, like throughout the story here, if, if bridge crew 4, like what I'm really rooting for, I think, is bridge crew 4 to stay together, even if they escape. And like, you know, that's kind of Kaladin's new unit, but they don't answer to the Alethi or they don't, you know what I mean? Like kind of like under their own accord, but they stay together as a, uh, as a a, force there. A crew of bandits, Robin Hood and uh, and, uh, whatever his people are called. I am terrible with names. (laughs) <laughs> and similar to, you know, just while, you know, you brought up the Knights of the Vale, while we're sticking with the Song of Ice and Fire comparisons, like the uh, like the Brotherhood uh, without banners, just without that guy getting killed by the mountain 17 times. Yeah, the other so. thing to the other thing to note and not to be morbid is that basically every time Kaladin has a troop and every time he has people around him and he kind of makes note of this, like everyone ends up dying. Uh, but yeah, him. 
So we could see a pretty bloody and brutal escape attempt here. Um, I know. But hopefully, hopefully, like, all I pretty much care about is if our boy Rock makes it through. Rock and text. That's that's the uh, that's the OG yeah. triumphant right there. Yeah, when we're learning more about Taft, right, he kind of gave away in this chapter that he used to be in the army, um, was definitely like a drill sergeant of some kind, uh, you know, led the men in, you know, and kind of getting set up there with the different drills. So kind of like the second in command, like lieutenant, I guess you could say first mate, perhaps is another another term we could use that Taft is uh, kind of grown into. Now we can talk about this when we finish part three, the uh, the recap here, but you know, Moash, Strehi, Scar, Lopin, Dabid, Rock, Teft. You know, I would imagine during this escape that some of these, you know, secondary characters that we're starting to become attached to aren't going to make it. So that's mm-hmm. definitely going to, you know, be gut-wrenching, uh, you know, if, if it does come to that point. Very true. Very true. Yeah. Now, one thing, though, that's on their side is at the end of this chapter, Kaladin makes a good point that, you know, by beating them down, Sad- Sadius prepared them to excel. So, you know, this is like the most battle-ready, hardened group that Kaladin has maybe ever fought with. And, you know, because, you know, when he was with under King Am or uh, Bright Lord Amarim, he he basically had the grunt of each litter and just, like, brought them up to fight as a unit. Um, So interesting to see, like, the opposite spectrum now, right? He's getting some hardened men that once he teaches them how to use the spear, like, they're not going to, you know, be scared or... Um, you know, kind of go through that learning process that he was maybe, you know, going through when training other men. So it will be interesting to see in part four how much of a time difference there is. You know, maybe when we start with the next Kaladin chapter, they'll be ready by that point, or maybe we'll get a couple more training chapters as, uh, you know, more information becomes availed about their plan. As of right now, it seems like he wants to go through the chasms and get out through the other side that nobody's ever been before which would definitely open a lot of things story-wise with, you know, Dalinar's visions and, you know, what's on the other end of the Shattered Plains and where do the Parshendi retreat to? You know, maybe Kaladin is who who finds that. But, you know, that's maybe getting a little bit ahead of ourselves here. We can talk about that once we finish once we finish the recap. Um, yeah, I'm not now, really sure where it's going. Yeah, I'm not I, sure. I think you're right. I think, I, think he's, I think he's, like, kind of staring off into the distance uh and you know like longingly looking at the the east coast of the chasms here but yeah uh, so, so that would be my guess just based on some like normal foreshadowing but i i really don't know what the plan is i was thinking too well you know while we're here we might as well talk about it i was thinking you know how he like rode the high storm and you know the last time that there was one and he dreamt through it right maybe the next one it'll show him a different path. Like maybe the next high storm path will show him a way through the chasms. And, and you know, that might be what happens um, because, you know, without any other sort of help, it seems like wandering aimlessly through there, the way Sanderson is writing about, it, it seems like he's setting it up as being impossible. So, you know, it seems like there's gotta be some sort of, uh, you know, variable that comes into play that kind of helps bridge uh, bridge crew four out here. Mm. But, you know, we shall see. They were weighing the different options. Like, you could climb out of the chasm during a high storm, but then you have, you know, not only Parshendi patrols, but also Alethi patrols. And, you know, even if you're on the chasm during a high storm, it's not, like, good shelter. You can still die there. So, you know, this seems like there has to be a, a wrench thrown in that, you know, maybe opens up a, a bit of a sliver of hope for uh, Kaladin and the boys here. Hopefully so. Hopefully so. Yeah. Now... Chapter 50, we move on to Shallan, and now, you know, we were, the way her chapter last, ended last episode, we were really looking forward to see what happened here, um, and, you know, basically, basically went as expected, you know, Shallan explains to Yasna why she stole the soul caster, and it kind of seems like Yasna, you know, despite, you know, being very mad at her and continuing, like, that hostility that she kind of showed when she walked in, almost seemed like she understood a little bit or, like, felt a little bit of sympathy. Like, just for a moment, maybe. Yeah. It's a vibe I got. Yeah, I... Yeah. I still think... I still think that... I don't know. I guess maybe I was proven wrong. But I still kind of have a... Some semblance in my mind that she was... She 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 was kind of cognizant about what was going on. Yeah, I think she knew that Cabsel was going to eventually try to get Shalon to help him steal it. 
but maybe she didn't expect Shalon to do it on her own own initiative. Mm, you know, okay. maybe like I do agree. I think Yasna was definitely, you know, her her antennas were perked up towards everybody. She told Shalon that she was, you know, hesitant about the king and hesitant about Cabzel and the Ardents. So, you know, I, I was definitely on the same page as you. I thought that she was on the Shalon a little bit, but you know, we, we do find out that Cabzel is dead here from the poison. The bread was poisoned, not the jam, but the jam had the antidote. So I guess the bread had the backbreaker powder on it, but only when the jam came in contact with the with the powder was the, the poison activated. Um I mean what a what a incredibly <laughs> complex like like way to try to kill someone yeah yeah and if he would have just poisoned the jam like he would have he would have had yasna she stuck her whole finger in it you know what i mean and also like she she doesn't even like jam oh i guess oh that's the point right she doesn't like jam so she would she would only eat the bread yeah what what the there's (laughs) no there's no better way to try to poison someone than to than to go through this like yeah, it's like two step bread process that you're just building over years. I mean, I, it's yeah. smart, but just just seems like a lot. He also tried it like seven different times. She never, you know what I mean? Right. Now, I was like so certain that something else was going on. Like I was trying to play detective during reading that chapter. Um, did not expect the whole like two two phase poison jam having the antidote type type deal that we had going on there. And, you know, I feel like this, you know, I don't think Sanderson is going to write the book in the way that he's like lying to us about what happened. But but I just, I don't know. It didn't, I, I, that the whole, the way that Yasna explained it didn't click for me while I was reading it, maybe because I was trying to overthink and look for other clues and the finger in the jam, I think I was just a little bit, a little bit too hung up on. But for now, I'm going to accept what was written on the page there by Yasna. Um, So yeah, I'm going to accept that. And then as Yasna is leaving, Shalon like reach like calls her name out like trying to apologize and she you know doesn't look back and keeps walking and that's the last that we see of Shalon uh in part four or in part three I mean so now like what do you what do you think is going to happen with her do you think she's able to go back home now she doesn't have the soul caster you know she doesn't have the um the apprenticeship now like she she's basically coming back really empty-handed I wonder if her character like just completely gives up at this point and goes out on her own just because she doesn't want to face failure with her family. Like that's kind of what I was thinking if she would just avoid home altogether at this point. Uh, well, I may have read this wrong. Uh, and you know, that's always a, uh, a distinct possibility, but I believe our last interlude took place in uh, Shalon's homeland. Jo- oh right, Jacobad, right? Yeah, yeah. So, are we sure that like her entire home life, like honor guard, like brothers and everyone, isn't just completely decimated and killed at this point after after that interlude? I mean, not to well, not to skip ahead. I think she might be going home to nothing. Yeah, well, we know that that Seth killed a couple high lords in Yakoved before he killed the king. Whether or not, though, that was Shalon's family, I don't know. Because, think about it like this. Her father was the lord, right? He died, but they haven't told anybody yet. So, like, technically, I guess one of her brothers would inherit it. Whoever the eldest bro- like whoever the older sibling was would, would uh, inherit it. But because they were kind of keeping the roost up that the dad was alive, you know, I don't know. Either way, though, that's a good point that I hadn't considered when she goes back to Yakoved, wherever her, like, estate is in, in, in Yakoved. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a completely different political landscape to the point where maybe like they don't even have to worry anymore because people are so concerned with the king dying that nobody's going to, you know what I mean? People might stop paying attention to her family now, or maybe it'll buy them some time. That's a good point. I don't understand. You know, there's certainly going to be implications of that, that uh, I guess we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. I think it's just like barren wasteland. Like Seth just fucking laid waste yeah. to everything. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't know at this point, like, I think, I forget how many high, how many lords and then besides the king and Yakovet he was sent to kill, but he might have just up, he might have just upended, like, the entire succession chain, perhaps. Um, but we can, we can talk more about that when we get, when we get there. Let's, let's first go to chapter 51. And this is, this was a crazy flashback that, you know, 
I guess I should have anticipated something happening with the shard blade that Kaladin had won. I kind of assumed that Amarin was going to end up with it, but I didn't. In no way did I expect it to to happen like this. Um, Amarin has Kaladin and his men in his office, um, and he asks him why he you know denies the blade. And I feel like Kaladin, almost in like defiance, decides not to explain himself. Decides not to really dive into why he you know, gave up the blade or didn't want it. He didn't want to explain, you know, the fact that, you know, the sword, like, just made him think about all his, like, dead comrades and, you know, everything like that. And at that point, you know, Amarim kind of steps away and motions for his men to move. And the next thing Kaladin knows, you know, he's being held down and his men are being, you know, slaughtered by by their own superiors. Um, You know, Amarim spares Kaladin for saving his life, but gives him the slave brand which makes sense to before when he said the man who gave me the brand even thanked me for killing the guy that I killed. Like all of that's, you know, all of that now in hindsight makes, makes sense. And all those, those pieces of that puzzle fit together. Um, you know, I was trying to think of why Amarim would do this. You know, obviously a shard blade would make him more powerful, both like politically and on the battlefield, I was thinking politically in the sense of like, it seems like if you have a shard blade, you're kind of considered a higher Lord than those that don't. But like, is he going to use it to like unite a left car and these like petty border wars? Or is he just going to kind of use it for his own gain? Like he could maybe make a power play here now that, you know, the King and um, Dalinar and Adeline are the way on the shattered plains, you know, Amaro might be the most powerful guy still in that left car, right? Yeah, so I think it's kind of a mix of, um, it's it's a little bit of a mix of kind of what you're talking about. So, so one, I think it's definitely a power play. Like he he wants to have a shard blade and a shard plate so that he can kind of uh, compete politically and militaristically, like at the highest level and be respected. Because they were mentioning that, like even if you weren't in a certain social class before the second you get a shard blade, like you're immediately in X social class. Uh, So so I think that's part of it. And I think the other part of it is basically this, uh, you know, this disparity between like what the, the stories are and what the tales are and, and what reality is where you're led to believe that, yeah, if you kill a shard bearer, that, uh, you you yourself become a shard bearer and you can climb the social ladder. But in, in, in reality, like I'm sure there's a lot more situations where this, like this, where, you know, s- soldiers are out there, uh, or like random soldiers are out there, like potentially killing shard bearers every once in a while. And then if they do this, like there's either people of higher classes or, or other people kind of trying to assassinate them to, to take that, that power away from them. Uh, Yeah. So I think for him, it was mostly a power play, but I think this might be a little more regular than, than maybe you're thinking. And I think Amarin's a dick. I don't, I don't think he's doing anything. He would not be, not be a dick. Yeah. And, you know, kind of, you you can see the kind of betrayal with Khaled in there when he thinks, you know, like you're supposed to be one that's better than the rest, right? You put on this roost for the men that you care and, you know, this and that. And it goes back to, you know, the chapter where he saw Adeline, like, kind of saving that um that sex worker, where, you know, still kind of ask him, like, why do you hate them so much? Like, now that we're getting, you know, the, the POVs for Kaladin seem to have been, the flashbacks, I mean, seem to have been caught up. You can kind of understand, um, you know, how between Rashon and Amaram and, you know, now Sadius, like, why he hates, uh, you know, Light Eyes as, as, as much as he does. Um, so it can definitely, you can start to see uh, you know, kind of what drives him in that regard. And the way it's set up, like, I would be shocked if, you know, by the second or third book, if we don't, if they're not confronted again at one point, right? Amarum and Kaladin. Yeah. As a conflict, you know, I, would, you know? I would definitely, I would definitely like a Amarin and, and Kaladin, uh, uh, a rematch after, after how things kind of ended there. I mean, and then also like, I feel like it was like very like I know we bring like a ton of things back to like a song of ice and fire, um, but it it was just very like there was moments in that show where the Lannisters or, or whomever like family would make a promise to someone, 
and you really had to pay attention to the language and, and the way in which they are making that promise. Cause mm-hmm. like, yeah, they might like, or like, um, like, uh, like even with Danny, like in the first book, when she, when she, uh, when they offer to like bring, you know, the call back to life, like everyone's just like twisting their words and being like, yeah, yeah. like I'll spare your life, but I'm just going to give you a slave brand for, you know, for no reason. Right. And, like, and all yeah, like veiled, veiled yeah. promises that have like another similar like to hell in the POV, the guys talking about the old magic, like you can get a boon, but there's also a curse that comes with it, you know, right. kind of sim- similar to that vein. Right. Right. Yeah. So definitely interesting. And, you know, moving forward now, just thinking about Kaladin, you know, where he is you know, with this story now, I, I just think Amarim is going to be a, a powerful player now going forward. And I imagine like, let's say, like, let's play hypothetical here, right? Let's say as the story goes on, Kaladin eventually gets a shard blade that he decides to keep, right? A shard blade that doesn't remind him, um, you know, of all the negative things that this first one that he earned did. Um, and he decides to wield it. And then when, if, if he's ever, you know, confronted with Amarim again, we could get an Amarim versus Kaladin rematch. Well, not a rematch. I guess it would be the first time they fought, but where both shard blades or shard blades that Kaladin won, that would be you know the the, the dynamic there would be interesting. <laughs> he's just he's just double uh double wielding. Yeah, like and by the end, then he kill, he kills him and by the he, end he's he just uh, he just has like eight shard blades and he's just yeah like, he just <laughs> the, gen- the them. general grievous of uh, shard blades. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Grow a couple more limbs, be able to wield them. That would be something. Uh, you know, I'm not going to... I don't think Kaladin can do that, but based off the Seth interlude, I'm not ready to say that he can't do anything. I think Seth... All, all doors are open for Seth to be able to wield, you know, as many shard blades as he wants, I think, based off of that last interlude. Yeah, he doesn't but, even... He doesn't even need shard blades. He's like, yeah, yeah I'm just going to put too. this away. This is exhausting. Yeah. <laughs> before we get there, though, before we get there, let's do Baxel's um, interlude. So Baxel and Av are helping a mistress. Now I went through and I couldn't find the mistress's name. So I don't think we're like, like maybe the mistress doesn't matter. Or maybe we're not supposed to know her name right now. Right. But Baxel and Av help her break in the rich people's houses and she just breaks art, but they don't steal anything. She just wants to break the art, which is, you know, a super interesting dynamic at Baxel at one point in the chapter, ask why that, why they do this. And you know, Av doesn't answer him, but I am very curious what, what her deal is with, with breaking the art, like what the motive is behind that. Um, yeah, don't know. Don't know. But I think the main takeaway from this chapter is really the old magic thing, right? Av explains how the night watcher, which, you know, I guess is connected to the old magic. I don't know if the old magic is like an umbrella term for a number of things or just this one spot where the night watcher is, and, you know, you ask for a boon, the Night Watcher will give you what she feels you deserve and a curse to go along with it. Um, as Av said, sometimes related to the boon, sometimes not. Um, the one example he gave, I think, was, you know, some his father needed to, you know, make, needed like food or, you know, supplies for his family. And the, the curse he got was that he saw everything upside down from that point on. So between that and then, you know, Kaladin mentioning old magic a couple chapters beforehand, it seems like a Chekhov's gone to me, right? Like eventually old magic is going to come into play here. Um, not sure what it's setting up exactly, but definitely something there, something to keep an eye on, I, I would suppose, right? That might be like Shalon, like, oh, like just a guess here, but like Shalon, like, conjuring the blood without using the the soul catcher and 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 seth conjuring things without using anything that that might be the old magic that is uh, yeah. being referred to yeah so perhaps right well uh, i guess we'll find out more now interlude two i don't know what bearing it has you know we were talking about sill and the relationship to high storms and just with Spren in general. So this was a very like Spren researchy chapter, which I, mm-hmm. I really enjoyed actually. Um, I love the, uh, I wish we would have found out like more information, but I love like dying into the, diving into the science of the world. And like the Spren mm-hmm. particularly is, you know, has been pretty captivating for me. Um, Garanid and Ashir are a couple from Pure Lake, uh, which, you know, we, we were in Pure Lake in the first set of interludes. Mm-hmm. Um, 
on a tiny Reshi Island. I'm not sure where Reshi is at this point, but I'll, I'll be sure to look on the map um, for, for next time. Now, Garenid does spren experiments while Ashir's calling is, you know, just like cook and experimentation with, you know, different foods and ingredients, I suppose, which, you know, that seems like if you're going to have a calling, that seems like the one you live on an island, you know, your wife just does experiments and you just cook. That's that's that seems like the the the, the top like if out of all the jobs that we've seen in Rashar, this seems like one of the better ones, I think. Yeah, it's just it's just country living. Yeah, just country living. Exactly. Exactly. Now, I would the, love to the... see uh, one of our cr- creative listeners uh, make a fake, uh, you know, home and country magazine cover with uh, with life out here on Pure Lake, with <laughs> with Garanid and Nashir on the cover. That's right. That's right. Studying the spread. Yeah, that, that would be beautiful. Spoon and air. <laughs> now, th- I don't know. I thought this was so. Garanid measures the spread. And once she met, so they're, they seem fluid until she does this. They can change sizes and they dance in the fire. But as soon as she measures them, they become fixed onto what her measurement was. And they don't change anymore. They don't even seem to move is kind of how it was explained, I think. And mm-hmm. as soon as she erases it now, they become, they become fluid again. But the interesting thing was that the husband, Ashir shouted out three measurements and told told her to write down one outside of the room without him knowing, and the 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 spren were able to obey the one that she wrote down despite her not being in the room, mm. which you know are spren like all not all knowing but you know do spren communicate with one another like was there another was there like a book spren that told the flame spren what the what the measurement was you think you know I don't know there there was a lot of and I don't think this is anything that we're even going to get answered, but just kind of talking about the science behind the spread, I think is pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. I used to, I feel like there's some like real science thing where like, if you measure it, it's fixed. Is that like time? If you, if you measure it, it's fixed, but if you, if you're not measuring it and you're letting it's fluid, it's, it's based on your perspective. I don't remember. That's above my pay grade. <laughs> is that like a relativity <laughs> thing? Who, who knows? Maybe one of our, one of our listeners who's, who's intelligent, uh, can can lead us in on that one but uh, yeah i think this is more of just like a a nice little nice little you know walk to the park a little little background chapter certainly a palette yeah. cleanser before interlude three that you know they want us to see the beauty of rashar before we see the uh, right right the violence yeah and then we've had a couple um commenters on reddit mention like oh yeah like spread discussions um, so it seems like this is something that the community probably has like talked about a lot, maybe without like any concrete answers. And I like the way that Sanderson kind of slowly like reveals um, information about Rashar and the Spren and kind of, you know, the, the inner workings of it. Obviously, once you're on like books two, two or three, you probably have a lot more information than we do. Right. So, you know, if you if, if there's anything up until the point we are about Spren that you think we might have missed or you think might be enlightening without spoiling anything, you know, definitely feel free to shout that out in the comments or maybe just to expand on like this one interlude to kind of maybe what your thoughts on it when you first read it or your takeaways. Uh, we would certainly enjoy enjoy that banner banner. But yeah, man, you mentioned interlude three. I, I guess I guess we can talk about it now. Basically, it's just Seth slicing and dicing his way to, like, the entire, like, royal palace of Yaakov Ed. But unlike in the prologue when he killed King Gavilar, like, kind of slowly, room by room, everything happened in the one dining hall. Like, uh, the king tried to set this trap for him here that clearly did not did not go well. What did you think about the trap set just by putting everybody in one room? <laughs> Obviously a bad strategy. I mean, I guess that he was underestimating. Uh, I think we're, we've all underestimated Seth's ability. You know, he's assuming we get everybody in one place. We got as many, you know, many people on one as one, but uh, on one as you know at one time. But uh, yeah, I, I obviously did not read the book or the scouting report on Seth here because he no. he, to- he totally went off. Yeah, did not get the scouting report for sure. Now. He Seth continues to be a fascinating character because he like mourns and hates himself while he does this in every single chapter, um, like truly despises like who he is and what he does. But he does find inklings of reasons to hate his enemy, 
where he searches them out, I guess, to like as a coping mechanism to keep going. And he decides to just put blame on the king for putting everybody in the same place because he can now blame their deaths on him, which, you know, you got to do what you got to do, especially when you don't, you know, to, in Seth's mind, he doesn't have a choice in the matter. Right. So I'll give him a, Seth seems to be setting. It seems to be getting set up that Seth is if not like the maybe not the main villain but like one of the villains if not like the, the anti-hero who's going to be put at odds with you know maybe eventually Dalinar or Kaladin or you know some of these other characters well but, it's like, interesting because he's like not it's not like born of his own motivation like he doesn't even yeah. have his own opinion on things like he's just doing like the true villain is the person who has the oath stone just making him do these things like right you know he, he's just showing up and doing his job Right, exactly, exactly. And, you know, he has, like, some thoughts on how, like, stone is sacred. And I think somebody mentioned that in one of the books, Seth has flashbacks, which that would be, you know, I, I'm i dying to know where the hell where the hell Seth came from and what his background is. But, yeah, you're right. Whoever has the Oath Stone is the true villain. But, you know, he's kind of like the, um, you know, if he were to ever get free will or if somebody else were to ever get the Oath Stone, like, he's kind of the, you know the sword and they were kind of like you know the puppeteer and the puppet i guess kind of you could say um but like i can't help but but like him in this scenario and i feel like eventually seth is going to be ordered to do something that's going to make me not like him you know what i mean against the character that we kind of like and i kind of feel sanderson setting this up slowly you know right now he's killing people that kind of have no no bearing on us or any of the characters that we've become attached to but i'm just Mm -hmm. kind of waiting for sanderson and you know who, the character who has his oath stone to kind of unleash him on on the rest of on the rest of our characters here, and that makes me very very nervous. <laughs> uh, certainly in the cards, from what we've seen, I mean, he, yeah. he is a destroyer of worlds in this chapter. Yeah. Now he's facing in this chapter three shard bears, right? Two of whom are wearing shard plate, the other one being the king. And you're right; at the one point, he drops the shard blade kind of it's so he, like he does a lashing where it seems like only a portion of his body weight is affected by gravity and the other portion is being kind of lifted in the opposite direction yeah so like it a makes quarter it a lashing lighter. what was that he's like he's like a some sort of mathematician like he's, he's like all right i'm gonna do a three-eighths lashing here so i can yeah <laughs> bend in such a way yeah and i was trying to like i know the basic lashing like oh, this is just a basic lashing and meanwhile like somebody's getting like a table flipped on top of them and like getting thrown through a wall. Just a basic lashing there. <laughs> Outrageous. <laughs> yeah. So I really I do appreciate the like the, the, the detail and the work that Sanderson puts into explaining that. Um and you know, it, it, like I don't know, I can't help but think about Seth flashbacks and like him learning how to lash. Um that would be, you know, definitely something I'm anticipating later on in the series. But he does, I, you know, I don't know if this was like he was sucking in Stormlight not only to like heal himself or like not heal himself, but maintain his energy um, and his power because it seemed like similar to how Kaladin could just kind of move guys off balance without having a spear in his hand. He was just like tipping guys over and tossing them one way or another with lashes, you know, this way and that. You know, if this were ever to be adapted on the screen... The action would be so disorienting, but I feel like, it, you know, with the right, like, camera work and the, the right director, like, you can make these action scenes, like, you know, one of the one of the cooler action scenes maybe that you've ever seen on screen. You know what I mean? I, like, that's how I think of it almost. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, just, like, the the change of angles, like, the change of... It, it'd be very, like, uh, Matrix slash... Uh, Oh, oh my god yeah what's the matrix what's the fucking uh what's inception the, inception yes matrix yeah, like a matrix in, like, inception but like on drugs like to the next level yeah. like uber violent <laughs> yeah ramped up i agree 100 percent. and i feel like it would be hard on screen to explain the lashings like we get it to a basic understanding he's just kind of making the you know whatever the wall is kind of like the center of gravity so they get sucked to that point more or less you know changing you know up and down but a lot of seth is inner monologue so he would be a really hard character i think to to put on screen um it would definitely take a creative director uh and screenplay to kind of get the character of seth right i think because without that inner monologue it would be really hard but man that those action scenes would would be worth it and you know shout out to sanderson for putting it on page in a way that 
you know, is clear and concise and that like you can kind of follow the point when they were both on the table and he flips the table up so that he stays on the table, but the guy gets sent from it. Like that was outrageous. Um, and, you know, eventually he kills the two shard bearers in the shard plate and he has the king there, you know, on, like, you know, basically execution style. And he, and he asks, you know, who are you? And Seth simply, you know, responds death. Um, so that was, you know, I thought the, the the prologue was Seth's coming out party, but this, you know, maybe seems like Seth's coming out party now. Yeah, I mean, Sanderson was Shalon here and, and just painted the picture for us. It, it was it was incredible. Yeah, so <laughs> Seth's a bad, bad man. Bad man. That like the Punisher of Rashar is kind of the vibe I'm getting. Um, now, let's think about this for a second, right? I have some thoughts on Shalon before we move on to the epigraphs, but while we're on Seth, you know, he he just took out all these high lords. He just took out the king of Yaakoved. You have a, a Lethkar where you have Amarim in the homeland, who's probably the most powerful, and everybody else including Navani, who was kind of supposed to be helping Elokar's wife back in Alethkar, you know, they're all in the Shattered Plains. So, you know, I, whoever has Seth's Oathstone seems like they're definitely trying to just cause as much chaos and mayhem as possible. And I can't help but wonder, you know, part, I think this ne- these next group of chapters that we have here, we have Dalinar, Kaladin, Adeline, and Navani are all the... POVs. Now, I think they're all in the Shattered Plain, so I don't know how much information we're going to have from direct sources on, like, what's happening in Yakovet and Alethkar. You know, maybe Yavani and Dalinar will find some things out, but once Shalan gets back, maybe in Part 5, if she's a POV again, which I, I think we said that she was, you know, hopefully we maybe she'll go back to Yakovet. I just am dying to know more about how this is going to affect, like, the political the politicalness of Rashar and like, do you think that the Alethi forces are going to have to maybe be sent back to Alethkar at one point? Like, I just imagine how this is going to affect our characters on the shattered plains. And if, you know, that war that Dalinor was talking about winning to go home, if they'll even be able to do that now, um, as Seth continues to kind of go on his, on his rage rampage here, because they know who the assassin in white is, right? They haven't seen him since he killed Gavilar, but he's back now. And, you know, everybody's going to recognize that. And like, what effect is that going to have once Dalinor and everybody else finds out that he's, that he has returned? You know what I mean? Yeah. That was a I, lot. To, to, to no, no, break no. Down, I, but... I, uh, I feel like Kaladin's arc is, is like pretty straightforward. He's trying to lead them towards an escape. I, yeah. And I feel like you might be in the right direction with the other people, like hearing from Yasna or, 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 uh, hearing from you know like scouts from Yakaved and then then like everyone kind of pushing back or and then like is this war with the the parsheni going to be over is this going to make them go like in overdrive and launch like a full force attack to try to take them out once and for all i think we'll have a lot of battle here but i don't know exactly where things are going yeah no i agree i agree so and i don't think we can really you know, I think next episode we'll be able to do a lot more discussion and analysis and like in terms of looking forward, because I feel like at the end of each part, we kind of have what information we have. But then the beginning of each part, that's when like answer or uh, questions are posed and then we can start speculating. So, you know, definitely our next episode, I think, is going to have a lot more of that. But the other one I just wanted us to kind of think about and, you know, keep in mind as we go into part three. You know, the demons that were with Shalon, now that the soul caster has gone she didn't mention in that chapter whether or not they were still there. So I'm curious to see once once we get to part five, if if those demons will still be with Shalon and, you know, kind of how that will continue to evolve because, you know, and, it, you know, Sanderson saves it for the end of the part when we no longer have her, her POVs. But, you know, that's when I, that's like the most thing I'm interested in with Shalon, not only what she does in terms of with her family now, but like, you know, the demons that, you know, she can see through her drawings and whether or not they're still with her. Yeah, look at you. Look at you becoming a Shalon head. Yeah, I know. Who'd have thought? Who'd have thought? Paul Rudd voice. Look at us. Look at <laughs> us. We made it. Now, shall we do the epigraphs for uh, for those chapters before we get into some Reddit comments and uh, finish up? Sure. Okay. What did we do? 49? 
49, 50. 50, and 51. Yeah, so 51 didn't have one, so it's just 49 and 50 for this week. Um, the first one is for 49, Radiant of Birthplace. The announcer comes to come announce the birthplace of Radiance. Uh, the note for this one is, though I am not overly fond of the Ketic poetic form as a means of conveying information, this one by Alan is often quoted in reference to Eurothuri. I believe some mistook the home of the Radiance for their birthplace. So yeah, this is in poem form. You know, kind of hard to understand, but the connection between the radiance and your authority again is mentioned. And this is, you know, the third or fourth time now that, you know, whenever in the story we find your theory, I think we'll find out more about the radiance. Where once we find out more about the radiance, we'll find out more about your theory, right? They're connected in one way or the other. Did you have right. any other thoughts on that one? Well, that's like, I feel like that's basically the. Yeah, the yeah. very, very straightforward, very straightforward. Yeah, and in that, remember when when Dalinor had that flashback when he was like fighting those, those like uh, xenomorph looking black monsters. Mm-hmm. They said that if you know if you want to train to become the Radiants, come to your theory. So you know, I, eventually, I imagine we said this a couple episodes in a row. I feel like, but you know, that'll come into it eventually. And I like the uh, the slow building process to it. Um, oh yeah, I, I we, love nothing more than returning to a lost city. Yeah, that's you know. That's you want to get my gears grease. Throw a lost city in the mix. Oh yeah, we're we're in there now. Flame and char, skin so terrible, eyes like pits of blackness. A quote from Iviad probably needs no reference notation, but this comes from line forty-two. Should I need to locate it quickly? Again, I think they're just just like I think it's just Yasna's notes describing, you know, monsters or void bringers or you know these things of ancient, ancient issues, ancient uh, battles um yeah just different accounts of the same thing i think the epigraphs in this section in general are pretty straightforward and don't really tie together beyond that like they're not like one full yeah yeah now there was like like in these epigraphs there was something about a dawn shard that i i I think there was something regarding a dawn in the in the prelude like a dawn bearer or something something along those lines that that made me think of that but until we actually see it in action like it's cool that yasna is kind of like her notes here are very like Indiana Jones ish, like the way she's kind of collecting notes and like thinking through these ancient things. That's like a you know I don't know why Indiana Jones is the vibe I get, but it is. Um, but once we like actually find more about it, it'll be interesting to come back to her notes in these epigraphs and kind of see, um, see like how close the 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 written accounts were compared to like when we first see a Voidbringer in the story. You know what I mean? So that'll be a cool little comparison. Um, shout out to Fixer for posting uh, the epigraphs throughout the weeks here, man. We really appreciate that. It, it you know makes my job a little bit easier. Um, so really appreciate that. If you want to keep doing it for part four, um, you know feel free, man. I certainly won't certainly won't complain. Let's uh, let's look through some of our some of our comments here from the last Reddit episode. We have Ksar Consumer. Apologize if I pronounced if I pronounced that wrong, um, but you said. You know, you said if we end up doing Dune after Stormlight Archive, you know, you would love to pick that up and read it along with us for the first time. Um, and, you know, thanks for putting out the content. It really keeps me from being bored while being isolated in the house. You know, I you know, definitely really appreciate that. And, you know, the whole idea was with the podcast, not only for people who have already read a series to revisit and like see us go through it the first time. But, you know, eventually to build up a large enough audience to where they're like we can all go into different books and series together. Maybe some of us has read them. Maybe some of us haven't. Um, but like kind of going it through it, you know, that read along process, everyone for the first time. Um, so definitely, man, hang around. You know, I think, you know, not sure when we'll do Dune, if we'll finish Stormlight before we do that. Me and Tom can certainly talk about that. But Dune is on the list on the radar. So whenever we do get around to it, if anybody who's, you know, listening to this pod or l- listen to our His Dark Materials pod, uh, you know, we can go through uh, some new series here together. So and as we do each series, I think we build an audience um each time so as we continue to go forward you know we'll have larger and larger groups to you know read through books together um so that'll be really fun and you know eventually i think the payoff and and the the community that we can build will will really you know really be worth it um what else do we have here i was just gonna say just on that anyone who's like really really enjoying the pod we you know we love your comments we we love your questions and everything but but feel free to also Um, especially as we're kind of, you know, maybe this is the last two or three weeks, two, three, four weeks with this book. Um, 
as we're kind of wrapping up this book, if, if you want to kind of be an advocate and, and be a, yeah, being an advocate for this podcast and, and, and help reach out and help us bring in more people, especially as we're kind of starting the second book of the series, like we, we would love to have any new listeners. And, and obviously we would re- really, really appreciate that. Yeah. And if there's anybody like if, you know, I know for me personally, I, I have a couple friends who, you know, I've been telling like, you got to read the way of Kings, you know, if, you know, a lot of my friends who have read, you know, Harry Potter and, uh, you know, Game of Thrones and all these other books that they really liked, you know, they told them you got to read the way of Kings. If you have friends like that and they think, you know, maybe a, maybe a podcast to help, you know, listen through as they go forth, you know, we would definitely appreciate the recommendation there as well. Um, so that's just some food for thought going forward. And follow us on Twitter as well at a pod has no name. That's where I've been posting the, you know, the, you know, updates on when we'll be posting and recording and things like that. Um, also, I've been doing some like searching Stormlight Archive in the way of Kings, avoiding spoilers, of course, of course, but, you know, sharing some other things on there. Um, so trying to use it more, but uh, just a good tool to see, you know, an update on where we are in the week with the podcast as well. Um, but, you know, Max Massier also commented, who, you know, commented before, appreciate you continuing to listen. Um, said last week that, you know, he loved the energy and the enthusiasm and uh, we capture the excitement of a first time read. And, you know, I don't think that's, I think that's just the book itself. You know, I think it's hard not to, especially, you know, me and Tom like this type of style of, you know, books and writing. So it's easier for us to, it's easy for us to dive into it and really get, you know, carried away. But, you know, great, great book, great series, you know, nothing but positive things as of now. And everything that people told us going into it on how, you know, it's slow building, but eventually like once the plot starts to hit, um, you know, right on the nose. And like, we're at the part now where it's, you know, basically hard to put down. And I know leading up to chapter like 64 and 65, we had a lot of comments saying that we should group them together. And I guess I should say now for next week, we're going to be doing chapters 52 through 57. That'll be about a hundred pages. Um, And then we're going to do 58 to 62 or 63. Not sure yet. Either 62 or 63 for the following week. And then we can have 64 and 65 grouped together. We had a couple people tell us that 64 and 65 they want to hear on the same episode. So uh, we're going to cater the the next couple weeks reading schedule um, around that. So, yeah, 52 to 57 for next week. And then if you want to go ahead to 62 or 63 for the following week, um, you know, feel free to do so. You know, Tom, did you have any other uh, any other thoughts this week before we hang it up? No, just <clears throat> like the last Reddit comment, I would just say like, you know, s- some weeks, you know, sometimes, especially like early in a series, we don't know it as well. We got to we got to bring the energy to kind of to sell it. But I mean, at this point, we're not there, there's there's, you know, not, nothing's uh, oversold here. We're kind of just we're, we're we're matching what the book's given us and uh, we're really loving it so far. And. Yeah, so things things are good. Yeah, also Reddit guy six twenty eight. Thanks for shedding some insight onto the Silver Kingdoms. Um, I just like to know the background on something so that when I don't hear it, like without giving like I can deal with like some light spoilers, especially if it's like the history of the world. Um, mm-hmm. So I have no problem with with that comment you shared at all. Um, and I just like knowing what you know the Silver Kingdoms are when referenced. So I appreciate you shedding some insight there, Reddit guy. And also Lesser, you know, uh, you know, weekly commenter. Appreciate that like bullet point response you did. A lot of great thoughts there. Um, so yeah, appreciate that. Now, next week, be sure to read fifty two to fifty seven as a refresher. Even if you read the book before, you know, just to just to catch up and kind of see what we're going to be talking about for next week. Get some uh, comments and and questions ready if you have any discussion questions from this week looking forward to next week be sure to put them on the uh on the reddit post when we get it up and you know we'll we'll get to that in a timely manner and we can use any questions and you know discussion that you guys put for the pod next week but you know until then this has been a pod has no name signing off stay safe flatten that curve flatten the curve